Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Dr. Chris Winter, who is a board-certified and internationally recognized sleep medicine specialist as well as a board-certified neurologist. His unique way of explaining sleep has made him a highly sought-after speaker and consultant for professional sports organizations with clients including the San Francisco Giants, the New York Rangers, and the Oklahoma City Thunder. He also regularly consults with the United States military groups as well as with businesses and large corporations. In addition to his consultative activities, Dr. Winter has a large media presence. Since 2008, Dr. Winter has served as Men's Health Magazine Sleep Advisor, and he regularly blogs for the Huffington Post, and he has written or contributed material to a wide variety of print outlets, including Women's Health, Runner's World, Triathlete, and details. He has made many television appearances, including on Fox News, and he's been heard on radio programs from New Orleans to London to South Korea. That is quite a resume. The, the book is The Sleep Solution, Why Your Sleep is Broken and How to Fix It. Dr. Winter, welcome to the program. Thank you. I think people could just save money and instead of buy my book, just record that intro <laughs> and listen to it before they go to bed at night. Man, that puts you right to sleep, I think. You know, uh, I have not struggled much with uh, sleep in my life, but I think this is interesting for a lot of people who, who wrestle with issues around getting enough sleep or what they perceive as enough sleep and so on. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a real interesting treatment to me in uh, the discussion of insomnia. I think more people think they have insomnia than actually do. I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think insomnia is this thing we feel like inherently we know what it is, but we really don't. Um, So, you know, if you're defining insomnia as an inability to sleep, I think you're exactly right. And and if you don't believe me, just ask your partner. You know, I feel like I slept an hour last night. What do you think? And the partner says, well, every time I got to go to the bathroom, you look like you were sound asleep to me. So... I tell patients all the time or professional athletes that I work with, listen, the perception of your sleep is not necessarily the reality of your sleep. I mean, as a kid growing up, I write about in the book, I never felt like I fell asleep on Christmas Eve. You know, my kids, it was so cruel that your parents put you in bed and say, look, you better fall asleep or Santa won't come. Good night. And they walk out of the room and you're thinking, wow, I got to get to sleep or I'm going to have to get presents. And So I never thought that I slept on Christmas Eve. I'd walk in the living room like, my God, there's presents everywhere. So I really believe that Santa Claus is magical because he actually came, and I was awake all night listening to Jay Giles' band on my radio. So I think that it's important for people to understand that what you think is happening at night might not be the case, and hopefully this book can help you better understand that. Mm -hmm. The the idea of sleep illness is one that a lot of people are familiar with, and, and it's something that people worry a lot about. Uh, it, it causes more stress and anxiety than a lot of things do, but it's it's fairly innocuous and treatable, really, right? It is, and and when you really talk about what gives a, a, a you know difficulty sleeping, it's teeth. You know what makes it, it? It's the word you used. It's the word worry. And so when if somebody were to say to me, "What is the definition of insomnia?" You talk a lot about it. How do you define insomnia? I would say it's a two part definition. Part number one is. It's an inability to sleep when you've decided you want to. So you've made a determination that, you know, you've watched Stephen Colbert's monologue, it's gone off, you know, and now you're ready to go to sleep or whatever you like to do at night. So you've decided it's 11.15, I'm going to bed, or 11.30, whatever. Um, So that's part one when you get in that bed and you can't fall asleep as quickly as you'd like. But the second part and the most important part is you have to care. Meaning, if there's somebody who gets in bed every night and takes them an hour to fall asleep, and they kind of like being in bed, it's quiet, their boss isn't yelling at them, their bed's comfortable, they can think about their upcoming weekend plans or their celebrity crush, then that, doesn't, then that person's not going to tell you they have a sleep problem. It, it's really it's the worry, the fear, the frustration 
that gives insomnia its muscle and makes it such a difficult thing to, to deal with when people have it. Mm-hmm. And this is, uh, although a, a lot of people worry about it and are concerned about it for, for whatever reasons that it, it affects their uh, performance at work or uh, their energy level, L- less than 10% of them have ever visited a primary care doctor to address sleep. And not only that, but you only get a couple of hours of training in medical school um, for <laughs> sleep, sleep medicine, right? That's right, and, and you know it's and that's I mean, maybe things have changed since I was there, but I don't think it's something that people really are trained to to do well. And I talk to primary care doctors all the time, and this is one of the most common complaints that people are having. But as you alluded to before in your last question, what are the negative outcomes of an individual who is describing an inability to sleep yet manifests no signs of sleepiness? So it's one of those conditions that's quite frustrating to people and upsetting, but in terms of it causing real problems, it's a hard thing to measure. Now, there's you know studies that have come out recently that said you know people with insomnia have more cardiovascular disease, and the problem with that kind of media message is, oh my God, if I struggle to sleep tonight, I'm going to die of a heart attack in my 40s, and it's not really. It's not that linear, mm-hmm. and, and that's the message that people are, are you know, if you're saying to me, look, and people tell me this all the time, I go to bed at 8 o'clock, and my next question is, well, how long does it take you to fall asleep? Two hours. Gosh. Why do you go to bed at 8 o'clock? <laughs> and they look at you like, I don't know. I've just always thought that 8 o'clock was my bedtime. Well, your brain has been telling you for the last, since the first Bush administration, it doesn't want to go to bed at 8 o'clock. It's, you know, so why not make your bedtime 10 o'clock? Mm-hmm. You know, it's a very simple kind of mental, you know, gymnastics that needs to happen sometimes for people to kind of understand that, oh, okay, well, I just thought, you know, if I'm having trouble sleeping, going to bed early, I can get a little bit more sleep and make up for these bad nights I'm having. That's the last thing you want to do. If you're not hungry for dinner at 8 o'clock, going out to eat at 6 o'clock is not going to make your problem any better. <laughs> I like that an- analogy. You mentioned that it, it's not linear, but, but sleep does have an effect on our health. The three pillars of good health, according to you, are nutrition, exercise, and sleep. So maybe oh, we ought absolutely. to be clear what sleep is. It's not the absence of wakefulness. It's, it's more than that because your body is doing some interesting things when you're sleeping. Absolutely. So, yeah, make no mistake, I, I strongly believe sleep is integral to our health. And that's one of the reasons I work with these teams is that they've understood for a long time, hey, nutrition's important for our athletes, and the way we exercise and stretch and take care of injuries is important. But it's also important what these athletes do when they leave the training center and, and, and go home and, and sleep. So absolutely sleep's important. I just want people out there to understand that nobody listening to this show is in danger of making choices outside of things like working three jobs well, we're not going to get enough sleep. And if you're somebody who says to me, I've got plenty of time to sleep, I'm not taking advantage of it, we can help with that. So absolutely, we want to make sure our sleep is very healthy, and we respect it. We're setting aside time to do it. And I find that with technology being so ever-present and there's wonderful shows that you can watch one episode after the other, I think we are allowing our lives to sort of intrude upon our sleep Whereas many generations ago, when the sun went down, there wasn't a whole lot you could do with the little whale oil candle lighting up your living room. Maybe if you're lucky, Paul will get to fiddle off the mantle and play a couple songs, but there really wasn't anything to do. And we spent so much time outside in real light that it really kind of kept our sleep in a much better place than what we're finding with our 24-hour society now. Mm-hmm. And I do want to talk about light and circadian rhythm, but first I want to look at a couple of important things that happen when you're sleeping, uh, like uh, removing waste from the brain and uh, reducing the likelihood of obesity are a couple of things that, that struck me. Uh, t- talk about the, the eliminating the waste product the lymphatic system is removing. Yeah, so when I was in medical school, I remember very distinctly being told that, you know, your body has this wonderful system called the lymphatic system to get waste out of your body, but, you know, the brain doesn't have one. And I remember thinking, that's crazy. The brain's most important organ in the body 
it doesn't have this. And it took uh, a researcher you know, many, many years to figure this out. There's a, a woman, and, and she figured it out. She's a researcher in Maryland and said, yeah, it, it's there. It's just very hard to kind of find because of the way we prepare cadavers and, and look at these things. So she discovered it, called it the glymphatic system. And when you look at it, it's very interesting what it does. One of the primary waste products it's removing is a, is a, is a protein called beta amyloid which is the major constituent of an Alzheimer's plaque. So the next thing that's really interesting about the glymphatic system is it is far more active when we sleep than when we're awake. So when you put two and two together, you understand that if you're somebody who is, you know, burning the candle at both ends, you're only allowing yourself about five hours of sleep a night because you stay up late to get work done and you get up really early, then you may be impairing your brain's ability to remove this waste product. So if you're doing it once or twice, you know, a month or a year, yeah, big deal. But if you're somebody who is consistently not getting enough sleep, as we all were when we were in medical school and residency, you know, over time, could that be pushing us more towards the development of diminishing diseases like Alzheimer's disease? There's also a fascinating study that was done looking at people who had the, the genetic marker for Alzheimer's disease. And you think, oh, God, I've got this, you know, apolipoprotein marker that's going to basically dictate whether I get Alzheimer's disease or not. And the study showed that individuals, even if they had the genetic predisposition to have Alzheimer's, if they really slept well and respected and protected their sleep, they were much less likely to get Alzheimer's. So you could actually alter these genetic predispositions by our lifestyle, which to me is so encouraging and exciting. So... It is important. We don't think about our sleep as being related to, you know, grandma with her Alzheimer's disease, but over a lifetime, it certainly could be. And uh, there's also been some studies over the last few years that indicate poor sleeping leads to weight gain, which I found interesting, too. Absolutely, and particularly in young people. Um, that, that, uh, that relationship, as we get older, uh, research has kind of shown it gets a little bit softer, but it's probably there all of our lives. It absolutely. So when you're not getting enough sleep, so many things happen. Number one, you feel tired, sleepy. So when you get home from work, the last thing you want to do is go exercise or mow the lawn. You think, oh, I'm going to lay down on this couch and put on Jeopardy and fall asleep, and I'll deal with the lawn or working out tomorrow. The second thing is one of the mechanisms our brain employs to help when we're sleepy is to eat. If you have to take you know, a car ride or you've got to stay awake during a boring meeting, it's very easy to grab some goldfish or M&Ms and a Diet Coke and, and to have something to do while you're driving or listening to this boring sales meeting. You're eating not because you're hungry but because you're sleepy. Um, and then sleepiness also affects our metabolism in a way that are very unclear um, at the moment, but we tend to burn less calories when we're sleepy. So if you can address getting more sleep, or if you're getting plenty of sleep but still feel sleepy, you know, fixing something like sleep apnea can have tremendous impact on our ability to lose weight or maintain a healthy weight. I tell people all the time, if you're overweight and there's something wrong with your sleep, it's going to be very difficult for you to be successful losing weight. So these are all very exciting things that are under our control, you just have to listen to your spouse who says, honey, you stop breathing at night. You got to listen to her. Go talk to a doctor about it. It's amazing how good people can feel and how much change it can make in terms of their health. Mm -hmm. and Not to sound like a salesman. And, and, and speaking of how people feel, uh, sleep helps brighten your mood too, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, I remember one time when I was in my, my neurology residency was a bear. This was before they started doing all the duty hours. So it was basically... You go in at 8 o'clock in the morning, you get off at 5 o'clock the next day, sleep, and start the process over again many nights. So I remember distinctly coming home one time. Within about 20 minutes of being home, my wife said, look, if this is the way you're going to be around you know, me and, and your kids, you should just go back to the hospital. And it struck me like a punch in the face. Like I didn't think that I was doing anything bad, but I'm sure if I could watch a you know video of myself I was irritable. I was, you know, uh, you know, snapping at things that really didn't need to be snapped about. And people will tell you all the time when you treat their sleep problem just how much better they feel. And if their spouse is with them, they'll say, oh, my God, he's just so much easier to be around. So, you know, make no mistake, you can have a sleep problem and you can independently be depressed or anxious. But 
it's amazing to me how many people deal with their sleep problems effectively and drift away from their antidepressants. They don't need them anymore because it was the sleep problem all along that was really causing the mood disturbance. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, let's distinguish sleepy from fatigued because a lot of people have them collapsed as if they're the same thing. Absolutely, and this is an important distinction. So, to me, if you're feeling tired, exhausted, pooped, worn out, sleepy, fatigued, it's important to really understand the word you're using has meaning, and you might need to convey that to your primary care doctor. So if you're feeling one of those things, the question I always ask patients are, do you feel sleepy? And when I say sleepy, what I mean is, are you, do you feel like you're strangely or unnaturally driven to sleep? Meaning you cannot stay awake through a church service, so you don't go to church anymore. You stopped reading three years ago because every time you sit down to read a book, you fall asleep. I talked to a young woman who was a college student who actually built a little desk, and she put it on a treadmill, and she would do all of her work in reading while she walked because she figured out if she sat down to read, she would fall asleep. She actually had narcolepsy. So to me, the first question is, Are you exhibiting something like that, a strong drive to sleep that you're losing control over? And God forbid, if you are driving and having trouble staying awake, you need to talk to somebody about that immediately. Mm -hmm. Um, That rumble strip is there for a reason. So that is a different thing than fatigue. Fatigue to me is the way a football player feels at the end of a football game or a the way you might feel after a 10K run or a difficult workout at the gym. You sit down, your legs have no energy, you really should go home and mow the lawn, but you don't think you have it in you to do that. In fact, I've had people tell me they're so fatigued at night, they have the energy to fold a load of laundry. You know, if that's what you're feeling, low body energy, that's a little bit different. And the problem is some people get home from work at 5 o'clock, they feel incredible fatigue, they get into bed, and it takes them two hours to fall asleep, and they're frustrated about that. Oh, my God, Dr. I'm so tired when I go to bed. Why can't I fall asleep? It's because you're going to bed fatigued, but you're not necessarily sleepy. They're really two different things. So understanding what you're dealing with will better help your doctor understand, oh, you're sleepy, so either there's something wrong with your sleep or you're not getting enough of it, or you're fatigued, which can be related to sleep. It can also be related to your vitamin D level, uh, B12, thyroid, depression, medication side effect, tick-borne illness. Lots of things cause us to be fatigued. But if you're fatigued but not sleepy, it's kind of pointing a finger away from sleep being at the core of your problem, yet a lot of people, when they're fatigued, they try to get more sleep. They buy new mattresses unnecessarily because their thought is, God, if I can just get sleep, I won't be fatigued. That might not be the case. Mm -hmm. And there are different levels of sleep. Let's just distinguish light sleep, deep sleep, and dream sleep, because each of them contribute something important. That's exactly right. So, And a lot of people have un- misunderstandings about that. Well, I dreamt last night, so I definitely got a lot of deep sleep. And, you know, deep sleep, we spend about a quarter of our night in it, and it's really when we restore, recover during the day. And it's generally seen during the first half of our night. So if you have a kid who wakes up in a different room that he went to bed in at night, or your spouse talks in her sleep, or you get up and eat things and don't remember it the next day, you're probably experiencing some disruption in deep sleep. And that's typically when those things happen. So to me, deep sleep is very important for us to feel our best the next day. It's very important for kids to get deep sleep because it's when they grow. Um, so that's distinguished from dream sleep or REM sleep, rapid eye movement. We spend a quarter of our night in that sleep as well, too, give or take. It comes in little spurts throughout the night that tend to get longer and longer as the night goes on, which is why our last cycle of dreaming is generally the most robust and the thing people remember. If you set your watch, your clock to get up early to go to a meeting, you'll often awaken during a you know, vast dream where you're sitting in class taking a test naked that you're not prepared for. That's always my nightmare du jour. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's important for our concentration. We talked about mood a minute ago. If your REM sleep is disturbed, you're you know you're walking into bed you're you're walking into your living room with a piece of paper and a pencil and you think to yourself what in the world was I going to write down I don't even remember or you go to the store to get some bread and milk come up with twelve bags and the one thing you didn't get was the bread and the milk so little concentration problems word finding difficulties are very common when you start to disrupt disrupt REM sleep not so much excessive sleepiness so understanding what goes on in these different cycles when they're timed during the night. 
can better help you understand that when you're suddenly, you know, dreaming a lot more than you used to, what that might indicate about your sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, did want to circle back and, and touch on circadian rhythms. You mentioned light during the day uh, affecting people who used to live on the family farms without TVs and, and tablets and and uh, cell phones. Um, and they f- followed the natural rhythms uh, instilled by nature. But it's different. Absolutely. <laughs> It is. I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to be. I mean, if you don't believe me, take your family camping, and it's amazing. You know, when that sun goes down and you're cleaning s'more marshmallow off the bottom of your shoe, just how motivated you are to sleep, even though, you know, I remember I took a camping trip relatively recently and about this David Bowie biography, and I was so excited. I was like, we get the kids to bed in their tent, and I'll get my little headlamp out, and I'm going to read this book. It's going to be so nice to have time to read pleasure books. On, and, you know, I got about, you know, seven pages into it, and I could barely keep my eyes open. And I look at my watch, it's 9.10 or something. I never go to bed at 9.10. Mm-hmm. Uh, my night's just getting going at 9 o'clock. So when we get out in that environment where we're exposed to that natural loss and gain of light, how incredibly powerful it is. It kind of awakens this thing that we've kind of lost in our body. So we can recreate it. I mean, when we get home and we're making dinner, we can turn lights off. I always tell my playoff you know, teams when they get in the playoffs, look, your job is during the playoffs, find three lights in your house that you would typically have on and turn them off after dinner. Mm-hmm. You know, really try to give your your living room or where you are in the evening, kind of a Barry White sort of romantic feel, you know, like you would you know, dim the lights and flower petals are everywhere. I mean, that kind of feel. I don't want you people falling and tripping over things, but if you can get rid of light at night and make proper choices in terms of the kind of lighting you're using, it can have a really big impact on your sleep. And if you just can't do that, then, you know, there's a little goggle, you know, glasses you can get for about $10 on Amazon that block blue-green light and they make it look like Bono, which is a nice bonus. <laughs> and if you wear those when you're on your computer at night or watching your Walking Dead episode, it can really help prevent that TV from making you feel like you want to watch another episode when it's over. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, let's dovetail off that and talk about sleep hygiene. I was really proud when I read this one. I'm doing a lot of the things you recommend with regard to a a nice bed and and, uh, keeping a dark room and keeping it a little, the air a little fresher and some things like that, that, that will augment your ability to go to sleep. That, you know, it's it's great that you say, I think augment is a great word. You know, when you look at media messages about sleep, one of the reasons I wrote this book was we talk about sleep hygiene a lot. I mean, it's very, you know, I almost like, do I even need to put this, does anybody out there not think a dark room is good for your sleep anymore? It seems like we've gotten these messages out. So to me, it can be very frustrating for a patient who says things like you, like, look, I'm doing all these things. My room is dark. It's quiet. I have sheets that are comfortable. and you know, But I still struggle with my sleep because the message is kind of out there that, if we do all these things, our sleep will be perfect. And it's not. It's really an augmentation. It's, yeah, if your mattress is really uncomfortable, getting a new mattress might make you sleep better. But I would sort of put sleep hygiene as about, I don't know, 25% of good sleep. Yes, we want to set, it's like the analogy I use in my book is it's sort of like getting ready for a party. You want your house to look nice and cleaned up, and you bought plenty of food for people, and everything's perfect. You set the stage for the party. If the theme of your party is super lame, then you're not going to have a good party, no matter how great the environment has been set up. If you if it's like a Dungeons and Dragons party, or it's a Jimmy Carter celebration, or yeah, I don't know what you know something that doesn't really capture somebody's imagination, then it's all for naught. So yes, we want to make sure that our sleep hygiene is taken care of. And if you're somebody out there who makes their room dark and quiet and cool, and that solves all of your sleep problems, awesome. Mm -hmm. But you may be in the minority. And I feel like that's where a lot of books leave people cold. Like once they've done all these things to their room, they're still sleeping poorly. They're like, well, what do I do now? And hopefully this book kind of addresses that. Yeah, there's a couple of things that that I would add that that I've been dwelling on. One of them is that nicotine, caffeine, and alcohol all worsen your sleep. They do. And if you're somebody, you know, alcohol is the most commonly used sleep aid in this country. If you're somebody who 
like, look, I got to have my, you know, Marlo, Mar- Mar- Marlowe every night before I go to bed uh, to sleep, you're wrong. You can sleep, not only sleep without it, you can sleep better without it. In fact, one of my very first sleep patients in the clinic that I practice in right now was a guy who was literally brought in by the ear by his wife because he literally took the glass of wine into bed with him. He would fall asleep holding it, spill it all over the place, and he was left with the chore of cleaning up his mess, and she got tired of it and said, look, you got to see somebody about your sleep because this wine thing is ridiculous. So these things do not help with our sleep. You know, have your wine if you think it's something that you need and it's beneficial to your body or you just like your meal with it, but have it early in the evening, drink less, you know, not more, um, nicotine and, and, and caffeine. Again, these are not things that are positive for your sleep. So please do not tell me, Hey, look, this Chris, I can drink a pot of coffee and still sleep great. There's a difference between being able to drink a pot of coffee and fall asleep and wake up the next day and sleeping great. I assure you, you're not sleeping great with that caffeine in your system. Mm-hmm. You can sleep better without it. At, at one point in the book, you talk about the Ten Sleep Commandments, and I thought that was an interesting twist on the original Ten Commandments, but I wanted to touch on Remember the Sabbath, Quit Sleeping In, because one of the tips that I try to follow is that um, you wake up at the same time every morning. Why is that important? It's important because your brain has very few things that it can look to to know where it is in time, meaning if we, you know, Walk, you know, walk around and look at our watch and it says 4.30, our brain does nothing with that. What our brain really latches on to are a couple things, some people refer to as zeit givers or time givers. It is light, it is body movement or exercise, it is food consumption, it is social interaction. Those things are important. So when we start our day off every morning with a bagel and an orange juice, we walk the dog around the neighborhood, it's a nice two-mile walk, Um, every morning um, outside in the light. We are now starting our day off with exercise, light exposure, and food at the same time every day. So your body really hangs on to that and says, oh, okay, this is the start of our day, and it doesn't vary. So to be ready to walk this dog and eat this bagel, we need to be asleep around this time. It's like the joke I always make with my patients, look, if I fail you, or, or, or kind listener, if my book fails you, join the Army. <laughs> I can assure you that many of your sleep problems will be taken care of by this wonderful guy named Drill Sergeant, or woman named Drill Sergeant, within the first week of you arriving at this camp, meaning that Sarge does not care if you stay up all night playing solitaire on your phone. He is coming to get you around 5.30 in the morning. He's going to strap a backpack on your back. He's going to run you for about 10 miles. He's going to feed you breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the exact same time every day. There is no napping. There is no sleeping in or falling asleep early. Very quickly, your brain gets that message of, good God, we better take advantage of this sleep time because we're not going to get any other. So it's very rare to find a Army recruit when I meet them in my clinic who says, yeah, I really struggle with my sleep during uh, basic training. It's very much the opposite. Mm-hmm. I have only have a couple of minutes left, and, and the, this book is rich with a whole lot of other information that I hope people will turn to in the sleep solution. But I did want to touch on uh, sleeping pills because, uh, you know, the old school is you give somebody a pill if they've got a sleeping disorder, but you uh, don't advocate that unless there's a plan for getting back off of that sleep aid, and it has to be for a specific purpose. Isn't that fair? Absolutely. Now, when you say sleep disorder, if you're saying something like restless leg syndrome or narcolepsy, then absolutely, we've identified a real diagnosis, and we may or may not treat that with a medication. If you're talking about insomnia, I want, I want your, your listeners to think of insomnia more like a symptom. And the analogy I use in the book is like blood coming out of your ear. If you go see a doctor and you've got some blood trickling out of your ear, and the doctor says, wow, you've got really bad coming out of your ear syndrome, let's pull a cotton in there and once you come back and see me in a month, you might let him or her do that. And you come back in a month and they take the cotton out and the blood continues to roll out of your ear. How many times are you going to let that doctor put that cotton in your ear before you finally say, you know what, I don't, I don't really understand what you mean by blood coming out of your ear syndrome. Like, when are you going to actually look and figure out where this blood is coming from? And to me, that's sleep medicine in this country right now. We, we go see our doctors and we let him or her give us a sleeping pill every time we come without ever really looking at, well, what is the cause of this? And, you know, you can make an argument, well, it's pretty harmless, but it certainly wasn't harmless to Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. You know, he went to his doctor and said, look, I'm having a lot of trouble sleeping. I'm getting ready to embark on this big tour. Can you help me? 
and the help that he got from the medical community eventually killed him. Um, all because we never failed to recognize, look, you don't need this pill. Let's talk about where this is coming from that you think you need it. So hopefully this book will kind of explore that and help people understand when it's appropriate to use a sleeping pill. You are a shift worker. You are somebody who travels around the world uh, for your job. That might be appropriate. Your dog got hit by a car. Sure, use a sleeping pill for a month if you need it. But there needs to be a plan for, okay, it's been a month. Let's start moving you off of it if you're not coming off it naturally already. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have. We've been talking with Dr. Chris Winter. The book is The Sleep Solution. It handles the topic with a, a blend of science and humor that's just a really easy read. Uh, I remind our listeners that if you don't hear our regularly scheduled broadcast on 88FM, you can also catch us on YouTube at Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Thanks for listening.